Hello and welcome to the second in our series on the three certainties. As a quick reminder, the three certainties we're going to be looking at are certainty of intention that we covered last week, certainty of subject matter that we're going to cover this week, and certainty of objects that we're going to look at next week. So certainty of subject matter is relatively simple. It just means that the stuff that we're actually putting into the trust, i.e. money or books or wine, as we'll see in one of the cases, can actually be identified. There's a few difficult areas that we do need to have a quick look at, but hopefully this should be relatively straightforward. So let's get started. As I said in the introduction to the lecture, the subject matter of a trust has to be identifiable and in particular it has to be separately identifiable. So in Re London Wine Company, the wine company in question went bankrupt. One of the creditors said that they were owed 50 bottles of wine. But it wasn't clear which 50 bottles of wine they were or whether they even came from the current stock. And so because the wine in question wasn't separately identifiable for that particular customer, the um, trust had to fail. Similarly in Re Gold Core, a gold exchange company went bankrupt as well. And so you have this vault which is full of gold, but it's not clear which um, pieces of gold belong to which customer. The difference in this case is that one of the customers was a bank and they had a separate account um, and sort of a separate vault where their gold was actually separately identifiable in this different account and so their trust succeeded, whereas all of the other um, customers, their trust failed. Now this is quite a harsh rule and it's quite strictly applied, but we did see some flexibility in it in the case of Re Lehman Brothers 2012. This case obviously um, concerned the giant financial crash that occurred in September 2008, where Lehman Brothers became insolvent themselves. The problem was that Lehman Brothers hadn't really followed the rules of the Financial Services Authority correctly. And so the customer money and the company's own money sort of got mixed together. And so it wasn't separately identifiable which, of, which was the company's money and which was the customer's money. And so it was potential that strictly applying a case like Re London Wine Company would mean that the customers would actually lose out. However, the court were probably quite keen to make sure that this didn't happen in the light of the financial crisis and given the amount of money that was in at stake here. And so they applied a more purposive approach to the rule in Re London Wine Company and said that actually the trust was created upon receipt of the money by the bank from the customer. I'm not sure whether this um, would be applied again in the future. Um, I think that for your purposes, you should strictly apply the rule in Re London Wine Company, but it's perhaps worth mentioning that the courts can sometimes take a more purposive approach as seen in Lehman Brothers. So, so far we've looked at gold and wine, which are tangible property. They're things that you can actually um, touch. Um, but what about things that are less tangible, in particular intangible property such as shares, which was an issue dealt with in Hunter and Moss 1994. In this case, um, Lord Justice Dillon basically said, well, um, the rule as relates to property having to be separately identifiable doesn't apply when we're looking at intangible property. In other words, when we're dealing with things like shares, the um, property in question doesn't have to be separately identifiable because it's basically all of the same anyway. One person's share in a company is essentially exactly the same as another person's share in the company. Um, it represents the same value. Now, this um, worked in the context of the case because it allowed the trust to be created, but it's not very satisfying. Why should there be one rule for tangible property and a different rule for intangible property? The Australian case of White and Shortall 2006 tried to get around this by creating a trust over all of the shares altogether and then dividing them up afterwards so that the total sum of the shares could be seen as property which is separately identifiable. But I'm not sure whether this is particularly a useful approach either. Um, it's not necessarily true that um, we can look at shares in that way and I think we just have to accept 
that for intangible property there does have to be a different rule because of the nature of the property in question. You can also see um, other examples here in re Will Trust in 1965 um, a, a reasonable income was left to the housekeeper in a will and the question was well what is a reasonable income? Now in 1965 they said oh well we can work out what a reasonable income for a housekeeper is and the trust was seen to succeed partially probably because the court felt a little bit sorry for the housekeeper who was going to be left destitute I think that realistically if that happened today the same case a reasonable income is not something that would be um, separately identifiable what I consider to be a reasonable income would be different to what you consider to be a reasonable income would be different to what a third person considers a reasonable income so the amount of money in question is not separately identifiable in that sense. Similarly in Re Kolb's Will Trust 1962, blue chip securities was the phrase used and this is meant to refer to shares in public companies which are seen as safe or good investments. But the question about what is a safe or a good investment is again a little bit vague. What I think is a safe investment is probably different to what everyone else thinks is a safe investment and so um, we can't say that that is really um, separately identifiable um, because of the vague language that has been used in setting up the trust. Finally, in the case of Don King and Frank Warren in 1998, these are two boxing promoters who had a partnership and the point of this case is just to put that uh, um, some non-transferable assets such as personal contracts can also form part of a trust as well so other examples of intangible property so we've looked at what happens when um, we're trying to achieve certainty in the trust by looking last week at intention this week at subject matter and um, but what happens when um, there is uncertainty and um, what are the possible outcomes well there's three in question first is that the trust simply becomes void and it's held, the property is held for a resulting trust that goes back to the original owner. That's normally fine, but what happens when we're dealing with a will and the original owner is dead? Well, often we'll apply the rule in Hancock and Watson from 1902. This is where property left to someone in a will, um, but is subject to a failed trust and the trust fails because of uncertainty. Then the property obviously can't revert back to the dead person. So instead it just goes to the person to whom it was actually intended and they kind of skip the trust element of it. A third alternative is that a floating charge is created instead and this is normally what happens when the phrase the remaining part or the remainder of my estate is used in a will or a trust instrument. The floating charge is not as um, solid as a trust in terms of its um, institutional status or its enforceability, but the floating charge does give the person an overall right to the um, property. And there we have certainty of subject matter in trusts. Next week we'll be looking at certainty of objects, so make sure that you keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, do the whole like, comment, subscribe thing. Also remember to check out the podcast, the UK Law Weekly podcast that is available on iTunes, new episodes every Monday, and they're also released on this YouTube channel on Wednesday evening as well. In fact, there was an episode recently about Acres and Samba Financial Group, which is all to do with equity interests. So do make sure you um, have a look out for that as well. Right, thanks very much for watching. Bye!